We are in Philemon. Philemon. And uh, I, I read the commentary on this. Some really interesting notes uh, to go through. Um, one of which is this is sort of a anti-slavery book. I thought that was pretty cool because in it, essentially, um, Ones Onesimus is a escaped slave of Philemon. And of course, the Bible doesn't didn't start slavery. Slavery was something that existed long before the books of Moses were written. Um, and God simply regulated it. And in the New Testament, we have example of how we are to treat those who are uh, in indentured servitude. And a little bit about slavery. So you were, as someone, if you had debts, you could sell yourself to another uh, if you were Hebrew, you could sell yourself to another Hebrew family and you would be enslaved for up to six years. And on the seventh year, like it says in Exodus 21, two, you were to be set free. So there was a system to this. It wasn't um, just whatever. But this is in reference to, I think, I think a Greek system of slavery, which is a little bit different, which is why it's very interesting what Paul says at the end. Um, because he's not trying to get rid of the system, he's trying to change hearts. And uh, as we would expect someone's heart to be. But it's right in the Bible. So it's an anti-sort of slavery book that's right in the Bible. So we're going to go through it today. And just to add, like, it's really like a form of servitude. Even the word slavery, the way we see it today, is like when you capture somebody and enslave them or somebody sold to you and enslaved. But in reality, this is more like being in servitude and another example of this is Jacob when he wanted to take Rachel's hand in marriage and his he offered to work for Laban for like you know six years or whatever or seven years and then at the end of that seven year period he was tricked and yeah. into marrying the little sister so he worked for another seven years to marry the other sister it was like a big thing but basically he's like putting himself underneath that person yeah. Right. And in some cultures, you know, you could do whatever you wanted to your slave. And, um, you know, there was a, like Rome, for example, had like, what, 60 million slaves or something like that. And uh, it was in the Hebrew system indentured servitude, but in other parts of the world, it was a more akin to oh, slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot going on because this is, you know, slavery, by the way, is still part of our world. In fact, there are more slaves now than any other time in history. So people are like, oh, slavery's gone. It's not. It's actually worse than it's ever been. Um, so there's a, there's biblical precedence against slavery, even though atheists will say, no, slavery is something the Bible teaches. Like, no, it actually tells you how to treat people that are indentured serv in, in indentured servitude, how to, you know, treat them fairly. And then in the Hebrew law, like it says in Exodus 21, 2, that they were to be let go in the seventh year. Um, and that they were to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you, as it says in Leviticus 25, 39 to 40. So there, uh, and in the New Testament here, this book here, it tells us, it changes the entire paradigm. So we're going to go through it. Okay, first one. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, Philly, Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. So uh, Philemon was at, am I saying that right? Philemon, yeah, right. Uh, is uh, He was at Colossae. So this was, uh, there's another book to the Colossians, but this was where he was at. And it is believed that uh, Apphia was probably his wife uh, and maybe Archippus his uh, son. So Philemon's son. Uh, but of course, we don't know 100%. And to our beloved... Where's my mouse? Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So we're going to stop there for a second. Um, you know, at some point in time in the future, God willing, uh, we'll have a teaching on what actually is the church. What should the church look like and how far have we left from that in our modern age? And how do we return to it? And what do we do for those that are in church? Because God still uses the churches that are out there today for people to get saved. Stephen was saved in a church. And so, you know, there's still good things and so you know we'll come up with the teaching but 
it looks like in the very early church that people generally met in their houses. And we see this in other parts of the Bible. Uh, we see it in Romans. Um, we see it in another place that I have to look. But uh, that's an interesting thing to note, that it was not a building, but people in their house who were meeting, eating, and loving one another, and helping one another with their needs. Then Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. This is Paul making mention of Philemon in his prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. So this is important. Do you want to, do you want to enumerate anything, Stephen? Especially this part? Not. Um, oh, man, no, not really. So love and faith was clearly seen. And this is important. It says, hearing of the of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus Christ and towards all the saints. The second line is that the communication, so the way that he lives his life, right? And it's in specific relation to his faith, of thy faith may become effectual. This is the same word that we use for energize or energetic, may become effectual. And it's also the word used to open a door to the gospel. So in relation, in Corinthians, it, it uses it there. So may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is that his faith, which produces in him good works by Christ Jesus and his work on the cross, is effectual in spreading the gospel and so if you ever wanted a verse for friendship evangelism, this would kind of be it, although that's not really what we're supposed to do. Definitely people can see the change in you and see uh, your faith changing and, and affecting everything you do, and it points to Christ. So that's what he's saying, is that the communication of thy faith, because he's living and walking and he's not saying I'm saved and I have faith. And, uh, Sean, do you want to go mute? I'm sorry. Please. He's not saying that people are going to get saved just because he has lots of faith, but rather that they're going to see his life and see what Christ is doing in his life. And that should be true in all of us. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. This word bowels, in the Greek sense, they used it as a means to express strong negative emotion. But the Hebrews used it in a sense to express deep love and affection like in the in the very deep part of me so he's saying for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee this man was doing wonderful work and people were refreshed by the conversation of his faith wherefore though i might be uh, much bold in christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the age, now also as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So this next section of the chapter, and this is this is a one chapter verse. Or, I mean, uh, this is one chapter verse. This is a one uh, chapter book of the Bible. Most books have at least more than one chapter, but this one only has one. And you can see here that in this first part, he's sort of, announcing himself, giving praises where praises are due. He's very tactfully dealing with what he's about to, or, or at least preparing for what he's about to deal with. And he's addressing uh, Philemon's works and the good stuff that he's doing. But now he's about to address something that's very touchy. And we can see a lot of grace and mercy. He's not blunt. He's not rude. He's not, he has the right to command. He's an apostle, right? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he entreats a Philemon as a brother with love using his brotherly relationship. Because I think I read, it said out of nine out of the 13 uh, apostles that are, are, are letters that um, Paul wrote, he addressed himself as an apostle, but in only a very few, he addressed himself to his friends, like in the Thessalonian letters, 
and in this one, because Philemon was his friend. And so this is where he sort of shifts and he's, he's saying, I'm Paul the Aged. He's building a case. He's painting a picture for what he's about to say. Being such a one as Paul the Age and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that's also interesting to note that he doesn't um, describe himself as a great apostle, but rather in bonds to Christ Jesus. He's not a prisoner of the Jewish people who are persecuting him. He's not a prisoner because it's believed that he's in Rome at this time in, in prison. He's not saying, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He's not saying, I'm a prisoner of the Jews. He knows that it is because of Christ that he's a prisoner. So that's significant, right? So this is now, as it says here, a plea for, uh, what do I say this name again? Onesimus, Onesimus. I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, not his real son, but like son in the faith. Paul says this often when he has great love towards someone. Uh, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So this is the story, as we'll read, of uh, Onesimus is that he fled. He was an, 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 uh, a servant, a slave of Philemon, and he escaped. He fled. And this is worthy of death in the Roman Empire because they had 60 million slaves and the slave uh, revolt was something they feared. So any slave stepping on a line, you can kill him. That was kind of the way they did things. And so he was worthy of death. But he's saying he fled, but now I have begotten. So in a way, uh, we see that uh, Onesimus has come to the Lord. So he wasn't saved and then he came to the Lord. Or he wasn't saved and he fled. This is not talking about someone that was saved and then did a wrong. This is somebody that was unsaved, that ran, and then somehow as Paul argues by God's providence, meets Paul and is then uh, saved through Paul's work. And so he says, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable. It's funny because the name Onesimus means profitable, and you'll see a play on words here coming up, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Why is Paul saying that even though he's fled, and he's not at his at Philemon's house um, serving Philemon. It's because by helping Paul, he's helping the gospel, which is the mission of Philemon as well. So he's they're both being helped by this. If someone were to donate money to Stephen and alleviate some of his time to serve in ministry, that's helping me as well in the mission of ministry. And that's kind of what he's saying because he's essentially helping Paul do everything that whatever Paul was doing at this time. Now he says, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. Receive him as though, because this is how much he means to me. He's mine own bowels. He's the deepest part. Paul loves Onesimus a lot. And he's trying to plea for Philemon to take him back. Because that's what you're supposed to do according to law back then. You were supposed to, in, in Roman law, someone could come to your estate and people would flee to Rome. And if there was an altar, even if it was an altar in a home, that person could take refuge from their slave master. But the, 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 the plan was that you were to uh, convince the slave to return to their master or uh, you would auction them and give the money to the slave owner at the time because often people that went into slavery or uh, indentured servitude uh, they went into it because they owed a lot of money and they couldn't pay whom I would have retained with me that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel Paul doesn't want to let go of him he's helping but without thy mind I would do nothing without talking to you first without bringing this up to you I would not I would do nothing that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. So it is unto the benefit of, it's like, look, if you're, if you're going to keep your slave here and he's serving me, that's like you serving me. And so, but I don't want to be so that you, ha I'm, I'm forcing you to do this, but I want it so that it's willingly. That's what he's saying. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, again, another gentle stroke or very, 
uh, tactful way of putting it, Onesimus didn't depart for a season. He fled as a slave. It's like illegal. But he puts it very tactfully and he says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. What does that mean, forever? Because he's saved now. And so, and this is what he goes into. He says, but now don't receive him as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. This abolishes slavery and was radical at the time, by the way, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? It is, there's no slaves anymore. There's, we're brothers, right? Because of what Christ did. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. So he's pleading with him that Paul loves him very much. And he's saying, I'll pay for everything. He says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written with mine own hand. This is me speaking to you. I'm doing everything I can here. I will repay. He will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. He's basically saying, look, I will pay you. I will, I will repay you. But um, don't forget that whatever Philemon, maybe because Paul was directly related with Philemon in his salvation. I mean, I don't really know what happened here, but Philemon really owed Paul a great, a great amount to some degree. It probably wasn't finances, but it could have been. We don't know. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. It's not talking about like our what we call bowels today, but again, the the seat of your deepest feelings. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt alt, thou wilt also do more than I say. So he knows that he's a good man and not good as in perfect, but good as in does well. But withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. I don't think he ever went there. As far as I know, he died in Rome. Therefore salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So we see a lot of things in this chapter. We see how Paul... Uh, tactfully deals with things he very well could in his authority be a brute and stamp his feet and tell people to listen to him but uh, instead he's tactful and he's uh, patient and he pleads and he's um, very meek in his uh, his rule uh, and we see here also that this idea that a servant is no longer a servant but also a brother completely abolishes the idea of, you know, people can say, oh, the, the slavery that happened in America was based on the Bible. Pfft. No, it's not. Because the way that slaves were not treated were not as brothers, were they? Can you enslave and mistreat a brother? No. So they were treated as slaves. And so, but the Bible stands against that. And there's tons of verses in the Old Testament, God regulating this because it was a, it still is, in, in a lot of senses, very real for many people. Unfortunately, across the earth, if you've ever seen The Sound of Freedom, there's pretty awful stuff happening around the world. Um, and so the, the Bible's been against that all along. So it's a very good book. I heard someone say, I won't say who, I won't say who, why is this book in the Bible? And I my opinion is these reasons, that... Um, that uh that Paul shows that he is uh how to how to entreat someone even when you have authority over them and also another just another verse completely abolishing the idea of you're my slave do as I say right now but rather we should be brothers in Christ and there's also this great verse about um how church was done which is in thy house and that concludes that's it 23 minutes, that's it, because it's a very short book, and obviously we don't want to jump into other books. Was there any questions related to this, or Stephen, if you have any Wait. comments, or any of that stuff would be a good time? Five months only. 
No, I swear Fine Mode had a couple of chapters. You find them for me. Yeah, go ahead. When you find them, then you can. No, I'm and... just saying maybe I misremember it wrong. Well, you definitely are misremembering it. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> It's not Philemon, it's Filet Mignon. Filet Mignon. <laughs> <laughs> one chapter. Just one. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, then. Steven. I, yeah, I must be misremembering. <laughs> Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I read Matthew Henry's thing before this. And, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I read David Guzik, so I'm interested on what else maybe I missed. I think you basically covered it. He goes into kind of some, like, Again, like it's not in the text here, but it's like outside relational right. understanding. Hmm. But very similar. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, yeah. I, I think he was, like, whether or not he was saved when Paul was actually in bonds or in just his service, you know, doing his mission, but he could have been saved, like, during actual imprisonment. Like ministering to another prisoner kind of deal. Yeah. Like perhaps uh, Onif On Onesimus was also a prisoner. Yeah. Yeah. What we know is that, uh, well, it seems by based on the text that uh, he was begotten in his yeah. bonds. So however that means, somehow, how the situation right. played out, we don't know. But somehow, while he was under house arrest or in prison, uh, this man and it's just amazing and it's also cool to notice like how god works right and we've seen things like this where like like what how did that connection happen how did this person get and just god does things and like we're not aware we're not aware of what uh god's doing if anyone thinks oh i know what god's doing you're, you're kidding yourself man you're you're what do they say your your goose is truly cooked or whatever is that what it is? Your goose is true. I guess somebody says that. <laughs> somebody says it. Um, you know, basically, you're crazy because, you know, as my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, or my ways higher than yours ways, as the heavens are higher than the earth, or my thoughts higher than your thoughts, we can't figure God out. We don't know. We just know he does stuff and he connects things and we just are supposed to obey. And, you know, the Bible says to acknowledge him in all of your ways and he shall just direct your steps. And so that's what we do. We just, God just does stuff and we obey. And we, we're not just hearers of the word, we're doers of the word. Was there any lingering questions about this? No? Okie doke. Well, let's uh, wrap it up in uh, <laughs> prayer. And I'll just close out the Bible study here on the video.